let's continue our study. <clears throat> we are now on chapter 8, but we will finish up to chapter 10 most probably today. Okay? Up to this, uh, this evening, God willing. But uh, I will not discuss in detail some of the items that uh, are there. Let me just quote to you a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. Now, be before I read that, we mentioned last week the difference between how, how uh, Bible people think than how we think. In the Bible, the people do not separate their daily lives from, from their spiritual lives. The effect of, of the liberals, the enlightenment, and now we call it the progressives, the effect is this. Bill Clinton was the one who actually said it openly, and a lot of Christians, if, if not most of the Christians, have adapted to it. Now remember, Clinton is not, is not born again. He's part of the American Baptist Church. There are so many kinds of Baptists. There is the fundamentalist Baptist. There is the conservative Baptist. There is the Bible Baptist, the Southern Baptist, the Northern Baptist, the American Baptist, and the John the Baptist, okay? <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Bill Clinton is uh, what we call as the American Baptist. There's another one. Oprah Winfrey is part of what they call as the progressive Baptist church. The progressives are the ones who allow same-sex marriage ever since. Now, this is from the 60s and the late 50s. They just started growing right now, <clears throat> but they have been there. So these, these liberals are responsible for saying, Bill Clinton said it, Leave my religion alone. I am different in the public life than in the private life. That is a very progressive belief. That is not Bible. Okay? Because in the Bible, your, your, your relationship with God affects and should affect and should be part of your daily life. That's why we were mentioning last week that, yes, the Bible talks about marriage. But there is what you call as two-pronged interpretation. Like prophecy, there is a double interpretation. <clears throat> uh, double interpretation, <coughs> meaning, for example, Jesus said, Elijah had already come. But then the Bible talks about Elijah coming back in Revelation. So double fulfillment prophecy. So now, when the Bible talks about marriage, yes, it is talking about our relationship with our spouses and our, our children, for example. But the ultimate meaning of the teaching is our relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we are what we call as the bride of Christ. And so the standards set forth by God in the scriptures concerning our earthly marriage is actually depicting of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, there is no separation between how we live our lives in the public arena with our private life. That's why, now you will begin to understand why in Leviticus, for example, there are laws concerning business. That's why Paul said, this is the whole counsel of God. Because you cannot say, well, this is business now, you know. Uh, this is not about the church. No, you cannot separate that. You, you cannot, that's why I, I keep teaching you in the past, do not sell products that you don't understand. Like, don't say that uh, this beauty product will make you more beautiful. That is a lie. That is not allowed in the Bible. And when you say I am selling five kilos of, of food, make sure it's five kilos. The scale has to be correct. Because you can say, well, this is business. No, that is your life. And you cannot separate your business life from your relationship with God. That's why there is a right scale in Leviticus. Tamang timbangan. Why? Because we believe in living righteous lives. So when you begin to say, well, this is my spiritual life, this is my religious life, that is not Bible. So we are coming from that. So now Jesus begins to clarify some of the things that... Uh, 
we encounter that we are now born again because we are what we call as Gentiles. Okay? We are not Israelis. We are the Israel of God, part of the Israel of God, but we are not natural, we don't have Israeli citizenship. Okay? We are not living in the land of Israel. We are called Gentiles. As Gentiles, in Bible times, most of the Gentiles eat everything. Now, there are certain food that are rare, so now the monarchies, the monarchs, not monarchies, the monarchs and the priests begin to make rules that it only belongs to them. Okay, just like in ancient China, there are certain colors that are very difficult to dye or to, to, to make, that they only make, they make it illegal if a commoner wears them. For example, there's a certain shade of yellow that only the emperor can wear. If you are a commoner in those days and you wear that shade of yellow, they can kill you because it's very expensive. And so now, Gentiles got saved. They were, in, in, because Jewish, Jews were the first ones to evangelize. The first believers were Jewish. So now, Growing as a Jew, for example, there are certain food you don't eat. You don't take it away from you just simply because you got born again. It's part of you. Like Filipinos, we do mano. Diba? So now, because I'm older, I find a lot of people now, before when I go to the Philippines, a lot of people shake my hands. That makes me feel good because then I... And they call me Kuya. Now, when I go to the Philippines, very few people call me Kuya. Only those who are older. And they don't shake my hand anymore. They do mano. <laughs> so, so that means I, they look at me as older. That is a Filipino custom and tradition. It never left the Filipinos. Now they are born again, but it never left them. However... We cannot go to the Americans and tell them, you, you, you meet an elder Filipino, magmano ka. You cannot tell an American that. Why? An American doesn't have that cultural concept. Now, for a Jew, if you are a follower of Jehovah, or of the Lord, or of yod hey bav hey, if you are a follower of the Lord, you eat certain food and you don't eat certain food. Now you get born again, you become a Christian. They continue not to eat certain food. They still don't eat catfish. There's a lot of catfish in the Sea of Galilee. Okay, I'm, I'm warning the Filipinos, don't swim there to catch. Okay? You will offend the Jews now. But, but the Gentiles don't have that. So now... The Jews who begin to evangelize the Gentiles ate with them, and while eating with them, they be, ano ba, ano ba to mga tong pinagkakain ng mga Gentile na to? You know? So they begin to be offended, and they begin to say, don't eat that, you're a believer now. Remember that Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the fulfillment of the prophetic utterances, therefore he, and he is Jewish, so don't eat that. And by the way, these, these Jews who are evangelizing can prove that Jesus did not eat unclean food. He did not. He's Jewish. You know, so he's a rabbi, so he did not eat unclean food because he's Jewish. So even, even our Messiah did not eat unclean food. So now, <clears throat> the Jewish evangelists can say, even Jews didn't eat those, so don't eat those food. So now, the Gentiles are rattled, whoa, I have been eating dinuguan all my life, you know. I have been eating uh, 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 shrimps. I have been eating all of this phenomenal food, you know. And uh, now you're going to tell me I will stop. So now there begins to be confusion. So now here, here we go to Acts chapter 15, right? That's the background. So Acts 15 is the initial big time argument and debate regarding what can we eat now as Gentiles. 
So later on, as, as that was implemented, the doctrine began to become even more solid. Why? Because, because uh, Paul did a lot of thinking and meditation about these issues, adjusting it to the changing complexion of the church. It's like changing complexion of America. Look at our restaurants here now. They are better than, than when it was left to Americans. You know? Because certainly we have Chinese restaurants, we have Mexican restaurants, uh, we have Polish restaurants, we have Russian restaurants. That is America now, so you can choose. Now, look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. I want you to read this carefully, okay? Those of you who are addicted to food regimens, look at this. Food will not bring us close to God. Is it the same in your, in your Bible? Read it. It will, it will build your spirit, okay? Look at this. Food will not bring us close to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat and we are not better if we do eat. The context here are unclean food, food offered to idols. So now we are Gentiles <clears throat> and Jesus declared all food clean in Mark. But in context, we know that he is talking about food offered to idols in the strictest, in the specific context. So now, Paul said this. Your diet doesn't affect your relationship with God. Food will not bring us closer to God. So why the Levitical diet? Because God does not separate body, soul, and spirit. We do. The Greeks do. If you are unhealthy, it will affect the way you serve God. For example, if you are lethargic, you are weak physically, so you come to church, look, up, look at you. Some, some of you who did not sleep well last night, uh, primarily Sister Nikki, you know. Because she came from the Philippines, so she has a reverse uh, clock, right? So what time is it for her right now? Time to sleep. Yeah, right? So because her, her, her body clock is still Philippines, it's normal for her to be sleeping. Some of you who, who watched TV last night, you are sleepy. Now, if you are sleepy, what will happen? Or you, you are so tired, you're doing laundry, you're, you're washing the dishes. Some of you with children, you're taking care of your children. You will be sleepy. Right? You see, you're so sleepy, you cannot even hear me. Yeah? <laughs> now, because you're sleepy, what will happen? I am teaching the word of God, you will not be able to understand it. So why in the world are you in the church? You know what I'm saying? So God is talking like that. The reason why he gave us the healthy diet is because he knows that if you don't take care of your body physically, it will affect your spiritual uh, demeanor. That's why six days you work, one day you rest. Now some of you work harder than God, so you don't care. But God rests on the seventh day to spend it with us. If you don't observe that, it will tire you. you, you can get sick. What happens when you get sick? Do you like, some people bring their Bible in the hospital, do you really read it? How, how in the world are you going to read the Bible in the hospital when, when you have all kinds of tubes attached to you? Hey, nurse, I'm going to read my Bible. Can you remove the IV? No, he, she will not. And then they give you some, some medicine that, will makes you, that makes you drowsy. You can have your Bible there. It's a decoration. You will not read it. Now, having a piece of book in your room, does that make you spiritual? Are, are you following me? Now, in the same way, eating certain food will not make you spiritual. The only reason why God put those diets in the Bible is because it will make you healthy. And today they say the most effective diet is Levitical diet. But even an unbeliever can do 
Levitical diet. It will not make them go to heaven. You cannot say, <clears throat> I only eat kosher. I'm going to heaven now. It's not going to work because eating kosher food will not bring you to heaven. You cannot say now, well, I, I, uh, I don't eat dinuguan anymore. Therefore, the uh, agency for all kinds of sickness and disease is removed from my body. It doesn't mean you are not taking food that carries germs that makes you sick. You see, that's why all food are clean, sanctified by praying, etc., etc. But there are really certain foods that will harm your body. But food will not bring you to heaven. So now, whatever you're eating right now, it will not bring you closer to God. Okay? And whatever you are not eating right now, it will not make you worse than others. Are you listening? All it is, is physical health. That's why the Bible says, for example, physical exercise profits little. But why do we do physical exercise? Huh? Why do we do physical exercise? Oh, you don't exercise. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm asking the wrong question, the, the wrong crowd, okay. <laughs> I don't mean to offend you, okay? But, but, but the re physical exercise will never make you go to heaven. Okay. The reason why we do physical exercise is because we think we are overweight or we think we are underweight or we think we are unhealthy, whatever the case may be, or we have not been sweating in 10 years. So we need to sweat, you know. So we do physical exercise. It's good for your health. But it will not make you go to heaven. Why is that important? Because in Bible times, if you will, in your history books, you will notice that when you begin to read books about Greek uh, monarchs, they are all naked. And even the emperors of Rome, when they have somebody do a sculpture of them, they will, they will, they will say, naked, naked me. All naked. Why? Because in those days, they, the, 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 the better your physique is, the closer you are to being God. Okay? And so a, a very good physique will be God-like. That's why the Phoenicians, friends of Philip, they told Philip, let us see Jesus. Literally, it means we want to see his body because Jesus was well built. Why was he be well built? Because he was a carpenter. You know, carpenters in those days are well built. You can't be a carpenter. They don't have power tools. You know, when you say, hey, we need some, some, uh, some, some beams. Okay, cut a couple of trees. That's what they do. And they don't have the power tools. And so they are muscular, and Jesus was well built. And so the, 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 the Phoenicians in the north said to Philip, we want to see Jesus. Literally, we want to see his body, so we, we will worship it. So the Roman emperors, when, when they do paintings and sculpture of them, they want naked bodies because they worship it. Okay? By the way, still to today, some, some people who do a lot of bodybuilding, they worship themselves. No, nobody is here anymore again. Okay. Have you seen if somebody go to the gym for the first time in his life? He, he lifts five pounds of weight and then he looks at the mirror. You know? <laughs> He's beginning to worship himself. Yeah, so. So the answer there is no way in terms to shall, shall it uh, move you closer to God. The word better that Paul used here, we are not better if we do eat, is, is uh, Paul's writing concerning your spirituality. The kind of food that you eat will not make you more spiritual. You know. My spiritual father, Lea Samuel, never exercised. Died of stroke. I mean, the, the guy has been, has been growing his belly. Now, I, I have seen the guy, part of how he lives. The, the guy is very busy. The busiest minister I have, I have ever seen. You put him in the car, he doesn't sit down and listen to radio. He, he takes his manual and starts writing, you know. And then, I, I have seen this a few times, and then he will be writing, and I'll ask him, what are you doing? Oh, I'm editing my, my next book. And then he, we can be four people in the car, in the middle of it, he will stop. Never talk to anybody and start worshiping his favorite song, 
Oh, the blood of Jesus. He will just start saying, Oh, the blood of Jesus. So I asked him one time, Why are you doing that? And he said, Oh, that's how I refresh myself. He will just go into worship anytime. Yeah. Never exercise. Died of stroke. Yeah. But became, 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 became unhealthy. And there's a lot of ministers like that. <coughs> Never took, took care of themselves. And they end up being sick because of the, the, pressure, the pressure and the rigors of ministry. You know, so this is, this is what's happening. But it will not make you spiritual. You will not get an extra credit in heaven because you go to the gym three times a week. Okay? And you will not have extra crown on your head because you eat kosher food. Okay? Are you listening? So, you know, why, why am I dieting then? Well, it's good for you. Physically. But that's about it. It will not make you better spiritually. It will not be, make you worse spiritually. My counsel, eat right. Okay? Then after that, Paul talked about his ministry. You're dealing with chapter 9. Let me give you a couple of verses just to give the gist of what Paul is trying to convey. Then we will move on to the next major lesson from the writings of Paul. By the way, this is, this is New Year. Okay, so some of you, going back to the previous topic, have decided that you will cut some weight or you will gain weight or whatever you will do. Just be consistent, okay? Don't, don't try to lose weight five pounds a week. That's unhealthy. A healthy way is you, you lose one to two pounds, maximum three pounds per week. Otherwise, it will not be healthy for your body. There are certain rules like that, okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. Am I saying this from a human perspective? Does the, doesn't the law also say, say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Now he's talking about missions. He's talking about the support in ministry. Isn't he really saying it for our sake? Yes, this is written for our sake, because he who plows ought, ought to plow in hope, and he who threshes should thresh in hope of sharing the crop. If we have sown spiritual things to you, is it too much if we reap material benefits from you? If others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not uh, hinder the gospel. Uh, the, the threshing floor is, for example, this is, this is the threshing floor. There will be a, uh, have you seen some movies wherein some slaves are, are pushing something and going round and round? Threshing floor is like that. Only this time you have uh, an ox or a donkey and they will be walking on the, on the grains to separate the uh, in Ipa, you know, and some farmers will be putting the grains under where they are walking. Now, what will happen, for example, if an ox is a thresh, a threshing wheat, he will he will see food. What will happen? He'll try to eat. It's an animal, right? He'll try to eat. The moment he eats, it will slow down his work a bit until he's satisfied. So, this is slave driver farmers. What what happened is they uh, they put muzzle. Have you seen what they put on the dog so that it will avoid biting some? They put muzzle. So it could not eat. So you have this poor animal threshing wheat, looking at the food and could not eat. You're torturing the animal. So, so they begin to find out these animals are tortured because they, they could not eat. So they stop. So what now the, uh, the farmers devise a, an object. You know when Jesus uh, told Paul, do not kick against the, the prick? It's a four-inch metal that they poke the butt of the ox or the donkey because he stopped working. So he, he will walk again. He will raise the floor. So not only do you torture him mentally, you torture him physically. Okay? And Paul used that again to repair to ministry. That's why Paul says, we minister to you spiritual things. Don't you think we ought to benefit from you material things? 
I was, uh, when, when I was working cleaning house before, I have a, a boss who was married to a Jewish man. So she told me, so that makes me Jewish also, you know. So she, she, she asked me, why, why are you working? I said, well, the church is new and it could not support uh, as yet. And she told me this. Jewish, she said, that doesn't make sense. I said, what do you mean? He said, doesn't make sense. He said, I'm married to a Jew. It doesn't make sense. I said, what do you, doesn't make sense. He said, does your people go to the movies? I said, yeah. What do they do? They pay the tickets because you go to the movies. He said, it doesn't make sense to me why people go to church and drop a quarter. That's what she said. She said, it doesn't make sense because for the Jews to this day, if you're going to be a member of a synagogue, you pay annual dues aside from the offerings. That guarantees not only the upkeep of the building, but it guarantees the maintenance of the ministers. You see? But, but the Christian church, the evangelical, the Pentecostals most especially, we are notorious for this. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of churches wants to make their ministers humble by, by starving them. You know, that will make you pray even more, pastor. No, it will make them angry. Like that, uh, like that donkey. Because he can see the food and he cannot eat it. You see? That's why uh, Paul used the human metaphor, again, because you don't separate one's spiritual life with natural life. I mean, in, in the natural, when you go to a restaurant to eat, what do you do? You pay. So the, the argument is, how come people go to church to receive spiritual nourishment? They don't give. It doesn't make sense. Well, that is different. That's just, no, it's not different. It's part of your life. You want to go to a nice restaurant? You know, some, some, and, and have you noticed, guys, in the church, the people who really complain a lot about money are the ones who doesn't give. Yeah. It's like going to a restaurant with your friends. The one who complains the, the most is the one who don't pick up the bill. Yeah, we, we were in a restaurant, Brother Willie and I, and we have a group of Taiwanese among us, and they were saying, is this the, a very good, oh, Brother Willie, you know, he knows this restaurant. Oh, that restaurant is good for this. Oh, really? Good. What about this? Oh, this is, also, oh, really? This is not a very good restaurant. The bill came, they all went to the bathroom. Yeah. The one who talks the most, the one who complains the most are the ones who doesn't pay. And, and it, even in the church, it's, it's, it's like that, you know. Uh, and Paul is putting it straight. He says, hey, listen, don't, don't separate your spiritual life from your, from your natural life. You, you go to the movies, you go to school, you go to all of these places, you pay. Now, we, we don't call it payment in the, uh, in the, in the scriptures, but it talks about uh, paying our tithes and giving our offerings. Because that, that is what, what keeps the, the building and the operation afloat. Otherwise, it will not be able to sustain itself. That's why there's a lot of, there's a lot of churches that close. Because some parishioners, I don't know where they get the doctrine, they think that God is going to rain some dollars from heaven. No. Have you ever prayed to the Lord, Lord, provide? Did, did your bank account increase right away? No, you have work opportunities, and, and there are certain things that you do. That's how God bless. He blesses through our daily lives. That's why you don't separate them. You know, you don't, you don't live unfaithful life for years. And then you begin to say, I repent now, everything is okay. No, you are forgiven, but everything is not okay. It's, it's like this. You are deep into vices. You, you, uh, you are a drunkard, you take drugs, so you get sick physically, right? Now you get born again. It doesn't take away all the ill effects of those drugs. You are still sick. Now, if you, the moment you start detoxing yourself and your body can still handle it, maybe you will recover some. That's why some of us who abused our bodies physically when we were younger... I mean, I'm just going downstairs this morning. My knees were in pain. And, and my son here, James, all he does is insult me. Old man, you know. 
Well, I did not go through what I went through when I was younger. Ne- never took vitamins, never do all of those things. We eat a lot of rice and a lot of rice and a lot of rice, you know. That's what we have. So, so, and then we work a lot. So what happened? It abused our body. I got born again. Did God make me healthy? Yes, but the effects of those abuses were still there. You know, I had a major accident over 30 years ago. I had physical therapy, but the doctor says, enough, because it's all about money. So I, was, I don't have complete care. What happened? I still feel the pain to this day. Do I pray about it? Yes. Do I go to the doctor for it? Yes. Because the moment you abuse your body, now God can, can come and do a miracle and you recover fully. That is rare. Why is it rare? Because of the law of sowing and reaping. What you sow, you will reap. Okay? That's why some of us who were ignorant in the past, we are just recovering now. That's why some of you are very careful now with the, the, with the way you eat. Because we know more and we have the abilities to buy better food. So now we are repentant. So now actually the, the way we are eating right now is just a symbol of repentance. From the past abuses that we had. That's why young people here, please listen to the older ones. Do not eat pizza every day. Do not bury yourself in macaroni and cheese. Okay? Have some vegetables. Have some meat. Have some fish. Balance it. Because I'm telling you, you get old. You will pay. <laughs> and you can pray to God and say, Lord, please let me recover. And God will look at you and say, well, 50% of your food is chocolate. The other ones are sugar. And the rest are cereal. That's, why you, what, that's what you have. You know, but... But even if you are not a Christian, if you take care of yourself physically, then what happens? You, you are healthy. Now, in the same way, in churches, um, if, if members don't participate in God's activities in the area of finances, then it, it, will, it will deprive the church of everything, that, that, of a lot of things that God wants it to have. Because, again, you don't muzzle an ox while threshing the floor. Because the laborer is worthy of its hire, okay? Then he talked about his ministry. Let me, uh, let me uh, give you another passage. In verse, in verse 13, Don't you know that those who perform the temple services eat the food from the temple? This is why I was telling you the, the sacrifice in the Bible, they're what the Jews call them divine barbecue. Because we... Uh, we think, we think that they burn everything. No, they, they burn the fats. Uh, before they offer the sacrifice, they remove the leather, the skin. And so close to the temple, uh, in, in what is acceptable by the law, there are tanneries. That's where they get their leather goods. Like these bulls, they remove the, the leather goods. And then the moment the fats are burned and everything that God wants is, is, is burned, the remains are barbecue. The people eat it. Okay, so it's, it's, they call it divine barbecue. So, uh, and those who serve at the altar share in the offerings of the altar. In the same way, uh, like, like for example, the table, the, the table of showbread. You know, they put 12 loaves of bread every, uh, every week. And they have a technology to keep it warm. They don't throw it away. The priests take these loaves of bread and then eat them. Okay, they eat them. So, sometimes we, we criticize the Catholic priests because they drink the remains of the, uh, the communion wine. Well, they're the only ones actually who drink it, you know, because they think it's imported, you know. So they don't give you the parishioners. And then they eat the remains, I think, of the waffles that were never consumed. That's actually biblical <laughs> because you don't throw away these things. Now, I'm telling you, I don't eat all the biscuits that remain, okay? I don't do that. I, I don't like them, those biscuits, you know? So, I just take the communion. <laughs> but, if, for example, after the communion and any given Sunday, I decide to eat all the remaining biscuits, that's still biblical. But I'm telling you right now, I don't, okay? If 
you want to eat them, you tell me. We can make arrangements, okay? Per grams, okay? Oh. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. For my part, I have used none of these rights, nor have I written these things, that they may be applied in my case. For it would be better for me to die than for anyone to deprive me of my boast. For if I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast, because I am compelled to preach, and woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward, but if unwillingly, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward to preach the gospel and offer it free of charge and not make full use of my rights in the gospel? So now Paul was, was talking about earlier marriage and the church. Now it's, it's, uh, it's the support of missions and ministries and ministers and the church. They're very much tied together. So now let's move to our next major lesson. Chapter 10. So we're done with chapter 8, chapter 9. Now let's go to chapter 10, okay? Uh, I don't want to discuss in details all of those things. So now we're first going to chapter 10. Let's begin to learn from the examples of our ancestors, okay? Learning from our faith ancestors. Now, listen. When we got born again, we have no business coming up with our doctrines. Okay, doctrines are not developed. They are passed on. Okay? And that's why uh, every, every Christian, you should be able to trace your faith ancestry. Like you cannot have a minister that got born again today and tomorrow he built a church and say, well, everything that I, I learned, all my doctrine came from, from God. No. There is what you call as a spiritual ancestry. And they are being traced. Our life of faith can be traced back to Abraham. The promise of the Messiah can be traced back to Adam and Eve. We did not come up with our faith just today. Okay, so nobody can come up with, with a doctrine and say, well, well, you know, I can, I can worship God anywhere. Yes, but our faith history tells us that we are told to gather together. Yes, you can worship God anywhere, but we are also told to gather together. Yes, our job changes and the demands are, are different, but you're supposed to sanctify the seventh day. You're supposed to have a day of rest with the Lord. So these are principles that you cannot say is Old Testament because they are before the Old Testament. Okay, now, so let's talk about learning from the examples of our ancestors. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, some translations, ignorant, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, now remember this, the Corinthian church is predominantly Gentile, okay? But then he said this, that our ancestors... Whose ancestors? It includes the Gentiles, so it's not physical lineage, it's spiritual lineage. Our ancestors were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. You see? Now Paul is, is making sense of what happened in the Red Sea crossing. He calls it baptism. Now we know what baptism is today. It's when you dip somebody in water. By the way, those of you who are going to Israel, even though you are already baptized, if you are baptized, uh, just for the sake of doing it, if you want to be water baptized, we'll go ahead and, and, and baptize you there, you know. But it's going to be cold, you know, so. So maybe I'll have somebody to dip you, not me. You know? <laughs> they all ate the same spiritual food and all drunk the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them since they were struck down in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us, so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Now, look, you see, I'm, I'm telling you the connection between, between their natural life and spiritual life. What was the evil things they did? They asked for meat, right? What did God send? Uh, 
yeah, how to go? Quail. I was thinking of the English of uh, Pugo. Yeah, quail. Now, is there something wrong with eating quail? Nothing. But why did God instruct them? They ate it with blood. They did not cook it well. Now, God wants you to cook it well. Because if you don't cook it well, you don't eliminate the bacteria. It will make you sick. It's all about, about physical health. You know? And some people say, what about steak? Well, actually, steak meat, you remove the blood from it before you, the, the reddishness is not the same as having blood in it. It's just the color of the meat, you know? Uh, that's just how it is. Now, these things took place as examples for us so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Don't become idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party. Now, look, look at this. The food was provided by God, right? So they sat down, eat and drink, and got up to party. What does he mean by they got up to party? Let's continue reading. Let us not commit sexual immorality. They were committing orgies. After they get full, they want to have sex with people that are not their wives or husbands. In a single day, 23,000 people died. That's why eating does not make you closer to God. After they eat, they got up and commit orgies. Where did the food come from? From God. It does not make you closer to God. They got up and start committing sin. Now, uh, let me push it forward. This is the same thing that happened in the Corinthians. They bring food, and, and the, some of the Corinthians did not give any food to other people. So, so what happened is, other people could not eat. By the way, we have to be careful in this church. Sometimes it happens. What happened? Well, because some people are saying, hey, I brought this food. Where is the food? They did not eat. And the food disappeared. That's what Paul was talking about. You don't think there is application here? Are you listening? Now, we encourage everybody when you come here, if there is an extra food, you bring home. But if everybody has not eaten, don't bring home. That's what's being discussed here. You don't think I can find application on that one, do you? But that is what is being discussed here. That's why some of the complaints that I have is, well, you know, Pastor, say I, I brought some food. I don't know where my food is. I don't know either. <laughs> That's why you have the right demand, where is my food that I brought? Because everybody should eat first. Are you listening? Now when people go home and say, well, I was told there's food and there's no food, somebody just sent. If some people brought home food or ate all the food while others did not eat food, that is wrong. Ay, nako. <laughs> verse 10. Oh, no, no. Huwag mo nang verse 10. Dahil may magdarit sa verse 9. Let us, let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Yeah. Buti na lang, walang snakes dito. Meron daga, you know. <laughs> Verse 10. And don't, don't complain as some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as examples. You see that? Again, it's an example to us. How, wait, where do you find example from an ancient is, is, is story today? And well, I'm just giving you the application. Again, when we gather together, make sure everybody eats. After everybody had eaten, then you can take home. Why? Because nothing should be left over. That's also Bible. Remember that in the Bible? Is it in your Bible? Is it in my Bible? Right? So you don't say, well, you know, I'm going to store it until next week. Don't. Give it to people who wants to bring home food. Because they have to eat it. You know, it will be a blessing to them. That's what it's being said here. And they were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. So whoever thinks he stands 
must, care, must be careful not to fall. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. You see, that's the context of no temptation. What is the temptation here? Gluttony, idolatry, and adultery. So when people say, well, nobody was tempted like this. No, it's common. Everybody has been tempted like that. I remember that, that uh, YouTube video from one of the big churches in the Philippines, a member of the church was testifying that, that uh, he is suffering. Why is he suffering? Because he's so handsome. What kind of garbage is that? It's on YouTube. And the pastor was endorsing it. So, so why are you suffering? Because you're so handsome. Oh, because I, I go to church and everybody is looking at me. No, you think everybody is looking at you. Maybe they're looking at you because of how you look, you know. And it depends on how they look at you. Maybe they look at you weird. You, the, thing, the thing is this. You will find, again, going back, these earthly illustrations have a spiritual application. So you don't separate private life from public life. Now, if I will flash back, because the immediate context before this is marriage and family, right? Listen to me. Because of this example and application. The way you treat your spouses is the way you're treating Jesus. That's what it means. Tahimik naman kayo. Ako yung kinakabahan pag kayo nakatingin sa akin na parang, di ba? The way you treat your spouses is the way you're treating Jesus. And there is, the way you are treating your children is the way you're treating God. You're treating the gifts of God in your life. The way you're treating your parents is the way you're treating Jesus. Yeah. Now, can you imagine the application there? If my children disrespect me, they're disrespecting God. If I exasperate my children, I'm doing it as unto the Lord. But now we separate these things. That's why now you will begin to find its application in the teachings of Jesus. You know, we say take care, the Jews say take care of your parents, but then somebody says, the, the mother says, hey son, I need some money. And the son says, well, I, I offer it to God. And the priest says, oh, you don't have to bless your, your parents. Because it's offered to God. Jesus said, no. How can you do that? You cannot bless God if you can't even bless your parents whom you can see. Ay, buhay. Yeah. And this is the application to it. You know? uh, that's why, uh, for example, I, I, I told my, my, my kids, should they bring a girlfriend in the house? I said, if I see them and they are disrespectful to their parents, I don't want them in the house. Because if they can disrespect their earthly parents, the more they will disrespect me. Who am I in their life anyway? That's, that's simple deduction. You don't need to think deep. If they can disrespect their earthly, their own parents, they will certainly disrespect their in-laws. Yeah. My, my wife asked me this several times. She said, how come in, in spite of everything you, you, were, you were nice uh, to my mom? I, I, because I, I did my best to be nice to her mom. You know why? Because I don't know how to harbor bitterness against my parents. I, I, didn't, I don't harbor bitterness against my parents. They'll beat me up and then I'll smile. I'll fall asleep after they beat me up. So you cry, you know. The best time to sleep is after you cry. Those of you who cry, you know that, right? Mamaga pa yung mata nyo, makatulog na kanya. And then the moment, <laughs> the moment I wake up, I, I will always be the first one to, to uh, greet my parents. And because of that, I really don't... My wife tells me, you're, you're nice to my mom. You do, you, because I'm like that to my, to my mother. I'm like that to God. I, I don't have bitterness against God. 
I pray for something and it doesn't get answered. I don't get upset to God against I don't raise my parents. Lord, how, what can I, I don't do that. I'm not like that to my parents. The way you conduct yourself on earth reflects your spiritual state. That's why the metaphors in the Bible are not, are not just metaphors. They're real life. They're reflection of your soul and your spirit. Are you here? I'm telling you this is good teaching, you know. You parents, you can use it to your children. And children, you can use it. You spouses, you can use it to each other. Man. You can say, Pastor says said this. In Jesus' name, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, can you imagine if you are a spouse and all you do is accuse your your uh, spouse. That's what you're doing to God. If, if you allow, for example, your spouse to do all the work and you just sat down and exercised your thumb in front of the television, these are the people who say, Lord, do everything. Let me just relax. That's the, the equivalent of that. You're, you're, if you are disloyal to your, to your friends and to one another, you are disloyal to God. But you see, the moment you begin to think, because I think this way, this is Bible. When somebody displays disloyalty and they say, but I love God. No, you don't. <laughs> because this is what the Bible says. Everything, what you, do, what you do in your life is a reflection of your spiritual state. Now, that, that becomes even a little bit uh, deeper. This is food to the carnals. They're not spirituals. Carnals. This is what is what is said. You see. Now, <clears throat> notice it says here. I, I told you all that they're predominantly Gentiles. Paul called the Jews of Exodus our spiritual ancestors. We we learn lesson. From how they lived, we we have to find ourselves one with them. That's why I don't believe this Calvinist theology that that uh, Calvinist theology that uh, what does I say that the church replaced Israel? No, they did not. It's replacement theology. There's a news last night. Look at how twisted our society is and how twisted religion is. Just last night, uh, I, I, I told you this a couple of years ago. I told you that the, the Methodist church will be split over gay marriage, right? So last night, the news says that the Methodist church approved the formation of another Methodist church. And they're giving it $13 million. Now remember, the properties of the Methodist in the U.S. is in the billions of dollars. And I told you a couple of years ago that the problem is not the Bible. The problem is money. Uh, the Africans, the Asians are conservative, the Methodists. And so in the Methodist church, one, one minister, one vote. And so whenever they put on the floor whether they will approve same-sex marriage, the conservatives, the Africans, and the Asians disagree. And there are more, there are more Methodist ministers outside of America than in America. In fact, Hans Dentist is lamenting that, are we going to be split? You know? And I said, yeah, you will be split. No, 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 we're okay. No, you will be split. Because you're talking about Bible truth here now. And so look, look, at, look at the language. John, I, I was telling this to John, and John told me, yeah, that's what I read. Because it's easy to read without reading. Because it, it says there that now they are giving the new Methodist church who will, who, will, who, will not, who will stay with being orthodox, they will not approve same-sex marriage, they will not ordain homosexual. They're giving them $13 million. The ministers will uh, continue to have their pension and retirement funds, those benefits, the medical med benefits. And I read it, I says, that is so corrupt. Why? Because those wealth was built by the conservatives. 
the few liberals kicked them out and say we're giving you 13 million dollars what they should have done is built a new branch of liberals the conservatives should have kept the funds that's their fund because John Wesley was conservative but you see how it was twisted it's like in America they're saying people well the, the, the gay the, they are 2% of our society the America as was founded was founded by heterosexuals with Judeo-Christian roots. But they're trying to oust us. It's just the same thing. You know, it's like children. Your parents build the wealth, build the house, you're old, and they kick you out. Oh, mom, dad, we can no longer take care of you, we want the house, so you go to the nursing home. And the parents, this is my house. You see how twisted society is? And so now, what Paul is saying is, hey, listen, you may be Gentiles, but your faith is not new. Your faith was taken from our spiritual ancestors. And so what happened to the Exodus generation, we can learn from them. So now it's talking about us now. Don't say it's archaic and it's in the antiquities. They were written, it happened for our example. Why? Because they are, they are our ancestors in the faith. You see? That makes us one with the faith generations of times past. So, that generation under the same cloud of glory passed to the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses under the cloud and in the sea. They all, look at this, they all ate the same spiritual food. What is their spiritual food they ate? Mana. They call it angel's food. What is that mana is equivalent to today? Jesus Christ, I'm the bread of life. How do we remember that? Communion. communion. You see that? That's the connection. The communion is equivalent right now to the mana that they took. But we bought the crackers. God rained the, the manna. Why? There were no bakeries in the wilderness. They can afford it, but there were no bakeries. So God rained the blessing. And it's Jesus Christ. You see the, 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 the application there? They all drank from the same spiritual drink. Where did they get their drink? From the rock. Did they travel in the wilderness? How many rocks did they drink from? That rock followed them. Because that, that is a miracle moving rock. There were no wheels on the rock. <laughs> but it moved as, because it's the symbol of Christ. Meaning, wherever we go, Jesus said, I will go with you. Jesus is our rock. So where is Jesus now? Where is Jesus now? Wherever we are. Wherever we are. Now, now you jump back to what we have discussed about immorality and adultery. Wherever we are. Oh, well, Pastor, so you know, I'm just, I'm just going to the night club. I'm not doing anything. Well, Jesus was there. You brought Jesus there. That's why you will understand later the additional teachings of Paul. That when you begin to do certain things, you are enjoining God with you. That's why it's punishable by spiritual disciplines. Because what we do right now is reflective of who we are inside. Yeah. What we do right now is reflective have you noticed, look at this. This is a rebuke and encouragement to some. Have you ever noticed that some of us are very eager to come to church? Nobody needs to push us. It's in our calendar. It's not in the clip physical calendar. It's just there. Why? It's part of our life. So when people say, hey, can we do this this Sunday? We, we begin to say, no, no, we have a service. We don't discuss that. 
It's part of our lives. I understand the dilemma of some. I'm gonna, am I going to be in the church? Some people complain. I don't want to lie on Saturday because you have to be there all day. We don't say that. We don't ask anybody to stay here for all day. You know why some, some of you stay here all day? You ask yourself, I don't know. <laughs> because I opposed that before. Even the bringing of the food, I was the one who says, we cannot sustain that. But that's part of your life. That's how you apply what you saw in the scriptures. You know? And so when people say, well, uh, at Lion's Heart, they require everybody to be there all day. You will not find that in, our, in any of our policy. People just stay here. They even watch football here. And maybe some people even come here just to watch football or something, you know. Because there was somebody before who just came here to play chess. There is no chess tournament at Lion's Heart. There are some players here of chess, but there are no chess tournaments here. You want to have one? Don't include me, okay? You organize it yourself, but I'm not in it. You know, so maybe James wants to be in it. He pretends he knows chess, you know. So, so however, although they were one in a lot of things, the Jews, they went to the same cloud, same Red Sea. Now, imagine this. Uh, all of these people with the kids, right? All crossed, all witnessed the uh, plagues of Egypt. All ate the, uh, the sacrificial lamb that night, right? All left in a hurry. That night when they eat, Moses said, don't eat wearing pajamas. Eat with your shoes on. <laughs> Remember that? What kind of dinner is that? You know, after you work all day, you want to have dinner and, and be relaxed. But Moses said, not tonight. You eat. And if you can sleep, you sleep with your, with your shoes on, with your traveling clothes on. The most uncomfortable way to, to, to sleep and to eat. Why? Because the moment a parent says, go, you go. So the children, the grandparents, everybody marched in the same way, went to the cloud, have some fear when the armies of Pharaoh were behind them and mountains were beside them and they begin to cry, are there no cemeteries in Egypt? That's why God wants to bury us here. And God says, uh, watch the salvation of your God. And Moses stretched forth his rod. And what happened? The Red Sea was congealed. You know what that means? It was frozen. I mean, the both sides were frozen. So they are walking through an aquarium. They can see the, the sharks. It was congealed. That's why those uh, Egyptians died. I mean, the moment it collapsed, you're talking about massive amount of ice. You see? All of them went through that. They went to the wilderness. All of them went through that. They went to the wilderness. They all ate the same manna. They were all happy when they were catching quails. How many did you catch? You know, and maybe the kids were bragging how many they caught. And some of them were disobedient. They saw maggots in their manna because they kept more than what they should. All of them went to the same stories. They saw Moses went to Mount Sinai. They saw the death of these 23,000 at one time. And then they went, they went to the borders of Israel and uh, Sinai Peninsula. Yeah? And Moses says, let's send 12 spies. The 10 came with an evil report. The 2 came back with a good report. What happened? All of them for 40 years wandered in the wilderness. Wait a minute. They all go to the same cloud. They go to the same Red Sea. They ate the same manna, drank from the same rock. You mean the old generation died in the wilderness? Yes. In the same way today, if we are disobedient, we can go to the same services, the same family camps, receive the same spiritual teaching. But if we are disobedient, we will watch an old generation wipe out. And God will have to raise a new generation to fulfill 
whatever promise he gave to us. That's the application. You see? That's why Paul keeps adding, no man can boast. I know, you know people say, well, God is limited with you. Uh, no, you are limited to yourself, but God can't be limited by anything. Why he is God? God? Being God has no limitations. It's a good sermon perhaps, but not true. Therefore, a community could be one in a lot of things. But God might not be pleased with some. Yeah. And those some are the ones who don't make it. Paul then said, these things took place as our examples. What kind of examples? Two things. Examples on what not to desire and what to desire. You see. The, the Jews in the wilderness desired evil things. Paul says, no, no, don't desire those things. They look at their neighbors, even when they were in the promised land, they look at their neighbors, they say, we want a king. And, and, and Samuel was very upset, they were rejecting me. God says, no, 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 they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So God allowed them to have kings. The reason why Israel had kings is because they're rejecting God. You know why? Who's supposed to be their king? Supposed to be the Messiah. They could not wait. Some of us say, supposed to be David. Well, David is God's God, but supposed to be the Messiah. They could not wait. They could not live like, why? Because we want to be like our neighbors. The neighbors that you beat, the neighbors that you defeated, the neighbor that God says, don't be like them, don't intermarry with them. You want to be like them? You know who got jealous so much? God. It's just like when we have kids, right? We tell our kids, don't do this, don't do that, let's do the following things. And they were doing it, right? And suddenly they begin to have, to have friends. And the friend says, TJ, why are you like that? James, why are you like that? And you begin to forget the teachings of your fathers. How does the parent feel? Whoa, they rejected me. That's how they feel. That's the application. That's how God feels. When God begins to say, this is my word, this is my will, and other voices come along and say, oh, this is okay. God says, no, 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 they're not, they're not. Do you know, guys, that, for example, if I teach something from the scriptures and you reject it, you're not rejecting me. You're, you're rejecting his word. You're rejecting him. That's why it is. For example, the Methodist Church. Now they are allowing same-sex marriage and push out the conservatives. They're not pushing out the conservatives. They're pushing out God. Are you listening? Now it looks like they're pushing out the conservatives. No, they're pushing out God. You know, these, these liberals who cry that they, they want to be socialists and, and, and they, they, they don't want God in this country. They're removing the Ten Commandments from the town halls and the school system. They're removing prayer. They're not rejecting the conservatives. They're rejecting God. You see, that's the application there. And so when you begin to see these things, God puts it this way. The love of many will wax cold. Many will fall away from the faith. It's not as many will fall away from their religion. No, they are falling away from their faith. You cannot separate your, your natural life from your spiritual life. The application is there. And so Paul said, don't become idolaters like they were. Don't be drunkards and gluttons like they were. Don't, sec don't commit sexual immorality like they did. Do not test Christ. It turned out they were, they were, they were not just testing God. Because in the Old Testament, God says, why do you test me? But now in the New Testament, Christ is saying, no, no, you tested me. Why? Because the rock is, that, I don't know how it happened, but the rock miraculously followed them where they go. That's why when God says, speak to the rock, 
you speak to Christ. Moses got so upset, he struck the rock. You struck the Lord. You see? And Joseph is, is telling me, you know, Papa, now, you know, I, I know what, why you name me Benjamin. Actually, he doesn't know. He just thinks he knows. You know why? Why uh, Jacob named Benjamin Benjamin? Benjamin. <clears throat> In those days, if you want to orient yourself, where do you look? You look where the sun rises. You look at the east. Now they change it to north. That's modern. That's why you call it orient, oriental. It's your orientation. You look at the east. Okay? But then, Benjamin means son of the south, or son of the right. Because Rachel died and there was sorrow. So he doesn't, he, doesn't, he did not look at the, at the east. He looked at the right. So it's Benjamin. Now you will begin to understand why after Jesus, Benjamin is a man of sorrows. Why after Jesus was raised from the dead, where did he sit? At the right hand of God because he is a man of sorrows. Because he was rejected. That's what it means. Don't come up with any interpretation. Okay? That's what it means. He's a man of sorrows. So he sat at the right hand of God because God was sorrowful. They rejected my son. They killed my son. But Jesus sat. Why did he sat? Because yes, Father, yes, they rejected me, but don't you reject them who believe in me. Because I took all the sorrows, I took all the pain upon myself. And so now God looks at his son. And the sorrows and the pains are there. It's no longer on us who believe. Are you listening? You see, that's what it means. What we do right now is an extension or a demonstration of what we are inside. So when some people are very bitter because their spirit is not right. They're just bitter. Somebody asked me years ago, Pastor, say, how come you're not bitter against your parents? My spirit is not bitter. Yeah. Yeah, they, they discipline me more than they should. I was deprived with a lot of things, but I'm not bitter against my parents. Why? My spirit is right. God made it. It wasn't like that before, but God made it right. That's why I don't hold any grudges against my parents. You know, I, I, I really don't hold grudges against anybody. My face may not look like it, but that's just my face. You know. What can I do, huh? It's not glorified yet. <laughs> but but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really keep grudges. It's reflective of my spirit. Yeah. One of my colleagues in our church in the Philippines asked me this. If our pastor called you for help, will you help? I said, yes. And then he, he told me, after everything he did to you, you have I said, yeah, I love him. He's a brother. Because I really have no bitterness against my, my pastor in the Philippines. Why? Because Jesus took all of those sorrows. Jesus took all of those pain. And because Jesus took all of those sorrows, Jesus took all of those pain. I don't have anything to carry them. Except the yoke of Jesus. Some people can't understand that. You know why they can't understand that? Because you keep your sorrows. <laughs> you keep your pain. You don't allow Jesus to have them. Jesus is our Benjamin, a man of sorrows. Okay, that's the way it is. Amen.